Okay, so how do I identify in terms of race and culture, right? So I am fourth generation Japanese American, Yonsei. I am mixed race, biracial, Japanese and white. And what I've realized over time is that, you know, my identity is fluid and that that fluidity is very important. Um, you know, I think it really depends on wh who I'm with, what I'm doing, you know, in what mood I, I'm in, right, how I might identify. It might be, you know, Japanese American one moment, Asian American the next. Um, I might say half Japanese, half white sometimes. Um, and I think I've, you know, I've realized that the goal isn't really to have like this permanent um, label for myself and that it's just not realistic. Um, it's not, you know, how identity works. And I think, especially as a mixed race person, it's just, it, it, it changes and that's okay, you know? Um, and the way that we talk about race as a society is also always changing, right? So by necessity, these labels are going to change. Um, and I know that, you know, they come and go, right? Like, and if you look at any of them kind of too long, they can start to seem problematic. Like some people don't like to say half because it feels like they're dividing them into fractions. Um, some people, I've heard a lot of people talk lately about the term Asian American and that it's, you know, it's too broad, right? It's it's um, encompassing too diverse of a group. And like, how can you use this one word to describe this really diverse group? Um, and I really think that any label is going to have those problems and any group is diverse and you can't, you can't ever find the perfect label and, you know, nothing is going to perfectly describe me. And so I think I've just learned to, um, you know, wear these labels lightly, you know, and just know that they're going to come and go and that, my sense of self is is found somewhere else. Okay, that's great. I mean, I, I can't identify to being um, mixed race, but definitely because of my kind of bisected cultural identity, I, 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 I relate to kind of uh, describing myself based on the situation that I'm in. So it's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the next question is um, related to the last question is, what has been your relationship with the word hapa? So I, I, I have a lot to say about this one. You know, I, I had the chance to research and write about the word hapa um, for NPR's code switch a number of years ago. And that really affected how I see this word and think about it. And I think it's important to talk about. Um, I, you know, I grew up in a in predominantly white area in Marin County, California, and I don't think I heard the word Hapa until I went to college. And at that time, it was presented to me as, um, you know, maybe describing part Hawaiian people, but like definitely describing mixed um, Asian Asian people. And so that's how I understood it at the beginning. And I wrote in that piece that, you know, when I first um tried using this word, it felt like trying on a beautiful gown that I couldn't afford. And like looking back, I I think that's so interesting. Um, you know, that when we're talking about cultural appropriation, right? Um, you know, I think, you know, it felt like it felt so good from the beginning. And I it was something that I wanted to use, but it, from the beginning it felt like something that wasn't mine or something that I couldn't really have. And, you know, I had that feeling from the beginning, but over time, you know, after that, um, you know, more and more people did see me as Hoppe or use the word to describe me. So because of that, I did let myself use it and it, it became a part of my identity um, and a pretty, a very positive part, some, a word that I really loved. But when I, I started researching this piece, I talked to Native Hawaiians who, you know, objected to anyone who's not Native Hawaiian using this word to describe themselves. And that was surprising to me because I had lived in Hawaii for two years and I had never heard that while I lived there. So I just, I didn't really, I had never talked to someone who explained this to me. Um, and so those conversations were really important to me. You know, people told me they felt like when Asian Americans use the word hop, 
violence, cultural appropriation, um, and it you know can kind of symbolize the way Asian and white people have taken over Hawaii. And you know, one person told me there are times when it feels like identity theft. So when I I finished that piece that I wrote, I wrote I I finished it by saying. Hapa is a word I don't think I should use anymore, but I also don't know how I will let it go. And I, for that last line, I've I've seen some criticism against me on the internet, and like I, you know, I get it, but I think I was just I was being so honest in that moment of this ambivalence I felt. Um, you know, I wrote that in a few weeks, and it it just like wasn't enough time to really say that I'm going to let this word go that's a part of me and just you know like I felt like I should but I didn't know how I was going to do that um and I think that's that can be one of the downsides to writing about race and identity because like you know as I said it's fluid right it's always changing but when you write something it becomes kind of uh, you know enshrined forever on the internet as if this is how you always feel. But, you know, soon after I wrote that, I realized that I, I wasn't going to use Hoppe anymore for myself. And it, in the end, it was very easy because um, it, it didn't feel good to me anymore. It did not feel good to me anymore. It felt wrong. It, you know, it felt um, like, you know, I think when I had somebody tell me to my face, this feels like identity theft, you doing this, like, you know, I, that's not something that I want to do anymore. So it was very clear in the end for me um, to move on from that. And um, I, you know, I feel completely fine about it and I don't, but I don't want to, you know, sit here and tell other people how to identify, but I do, I just urge any, you know, any mixed race Asian American person who uses that word to, you know, do the research, talk to people, know why people might object to it, know why someone might call that cultural appropriation, and then, you know, make your decision from there. Yeah, I, you know, the article's really interesting, because, you know, you picked up on, like, um, different perspectives, um, in terms of, like, how people in Hawaii view others using the word, and I really appreciate that you, you chose the least harmful path, and, um, I think another thing that's interesting is like um, maybe you didn't hear it when you're living in Hawaii because people don't feel really empowered to speak up about it until you are asking them directly what they think. So I think it's really great that in, that uh, you gave a platform to those voices because, you know, otherwise maybe we wouldn't hear it. Right, right. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so... Um, Next question, why did you decide to go to Japan as a college student? So, um, so as I said, I grew up in a very white place. And, um, you know, for me, when I was younger, that meant that I felt different, that I didn't, you know, I, I wanted to be like others around me. And that meant at that time being white. And um, it meant wanting to downplay the Japanese side of me I was like very quick to say oh maybe I have a Japanese first name but I'm fourth generation my it was my great grandparents that came from Japan I don't know anything about Japan I don't speak Japanese you know and all at the time all of that was true I didn't I really didn't know much about Japan at all um I think I was trying to say like you know I'm not I am not this identity you're putting on me, but in other ways I was right. And I, it just, it didn't, again, it didn't feel good. None of that felt good. So when I went to college, I saw that I had an opportunity to, you know, be someone else, do something different. And I, I did this sort of 180 and just immersed myself into all things Japanese. I started studying Japanese. I decided to major in East Asian studies. I, um, signed up to go to Japan my junior year and um, live in live and study in Kyoto, and um, it you know wasn't this plan that I had, but it was I think again just follow following what felt good to me and kind of intuitively what I I needed and wanted, and very quickly I saw that you know um, this acquiring this 
technical knowledge and the language was really important to me. And, you know, all those years of being ashamed of this part of me turning around and doing the opposite and just fully embracing it, it it felt incredibly healing to me. And it, it was only that I just, in thinking about this talk that I first put that word to it, that it was healing. And I, and I really think that was what it was for me. Well, kudos to you for, you know, realizing this at such a young age. I think, you know, a lot of us, we struggled with it for so long. <laughs> like me, it took me so much longer to realize um, what harm it was doing for me to like try to assimilate so hard. Um, okay, so next question is, uh, um, you also traveled to Okinawa during your time in Japan. And uh, so what drew you to the place and inspired you to eventually write a book about it? Yeah, so, um, so, you know, like, so saying all that I just said is true, but then what also was true is that, you know, when I did go to Japan, it was not easy. It was that year was actually very hard. You know, I was just 20 years old. And, um, you know, I think, like a lot of people when you're in the US, people of color, like you, you will be identified a certain way in the US, right? I would be identified as Japanese sometimes or seen as a foreigner even, right? But when I went to Japan, I, you know, obviously I very quickly saw I am not really Japanese, Japanese. I am American. And when I was there, people saw me as a foreigner. I was not like embraced as a Japanese person at all, right? So, um, you know, I think I expected that on some level and it was fine, but then on another level, it was hard to experience that and feel like, well, you know, where can I be then? Right? Where's the place for me and all of that. Um, so it was, it was during that year that I went to Okinawa for the first time and, you know, right away I saw that it was very different from mainland Japan. And I learned about how it, you know, was used to be an independent kingdom. It has its own culture, languages, history, people, right? It's, it's a different place. And it has this um, very heavy presence of U.S. military bases, which also, you know, marks it apart from the rest of Japan. Um, and I found that I was feeling kind of a connection to Okinawa that I hadn't really felt to mainland Japan, even though I am not Okinawa and my family's not from Okinawa. And part of it at first was that there are a lot of mixed race people there, especially around the U.S. military bases, um, you know, because of the relationships between service members and women in Okinawa. So I volunteered at a school for that was um, primarily for mixed race kids in Okinawa, you know, in college for a summer. And it was, you know, like just for someone like me, it was like this dream place of how, you know, that I could have only dreamt about as a kid, right. Where there are all these kids who are mixed and, um, you know, I, I was just so kind of blown away by that and, and drawn to it. And then it just, it went from there. Like then I became interested in these, um, communities around the bases that are also very, um, multicultural American, Japanese, Okinawan mix. And, um, also I think, you know, more broadly, like this position that Okinawa has been placed in, be, you know, kind of between the United States and Japan, um, that I think mirrored in some ways, like what I felt on, you know, in a very different way. Um, and so, you know, for all of those reasons, I kind of kept coming back to Okinawa and I just, I would try to leave, but I kept coming back and I just couldn't, you know, I just felt like at some point I had to write about this. Um, and, you know, because we're talking about cultural appropriation, I did want to bring up the question of, you know, who can write which stories and, you know, because I'm not Okinawan, you know, could, should I have written a book about Okinawa? You know, I'm, if I'm Japanese American, there is, um, the history of Japan and the U S and Okinawa, right. And that they colonized, occupied Okinawa. So there's like that power structure and history there right um and it's something that I you know have thought about a lot and um it's a like it's a very big topic I'm I've been reading a book called appropriate by 
Paisley rec doll. I really recommend, recommend that for anybody who's interested in um, cultural appropriation and literature, because she goes like very deep into all of these questions. Um, but, you know, I can just speak for myself and, and I wanted to just talk about some of the reasons why I felt like I could write this book about, you know, a place that I was not connected to in that way. Um, and I think, you know, one was that I was writing about not just Okinawa, but the U.S. military in Okinawa and that relationship and that history. And I, you know, I quickly saw that this is a story that I and all Americans are complicit in and are involved in. And, you know, this is a history that we should know, but we don't know. And so that became one of my goals really is to shine a light on this history that Americans, um, it's a, an American story, right? But we don't know about same for Japan, right? Um, and then I think another way I approached it was, you know, as a journalist who was trying to get the story right, right, by spending a lot of time there, interviewing as many people as possible, doing in-depth interviews, and um, always trying, I was very aware of the stereotypes that existed about people in this story and wanting to, you know, write against those stereotypes and um, present people in three-dimensional nuanced ways, you know, that was really important to me. Um, and then also really, you know, make it clear that it was all filtered through my point of view, that there's no like objective true story, right? That this is my point of view as a mixed race Japanese American woman. Um, and I think something that's important to me is that if somebody really wants to know about Okinawa, understand Okinawa, they also have to read books by Okinawan authors because those will inevitably, you know, offer something that mine can't. Like um, there was a book that came out recently called Speak Okinawa by Elizabeth Miki Brina. And she, you know, so intimately and powerfully um, paints a picture of her family and the intergenerational trauma of the U.S., war and occupation and um so to you know to read books like that is is very important too um and then just thinking about this there was there's just one more thing that happened recently um i recently you know announced on social media about my second book which is um about the japanese american incarceration during world war ii and someone wrote back have you read the book Snow Falling on Cedars? And I don't know if you remember that book or heard of it, but I, I had to look it up to confirm that it, it is like, it's 30 years old. It was written by a white man. It's about a romance between a white man and a Japanese American woman. It's about like a murder. And, you know, I haven't read it in a long time, but it's, you know, I have a feeling there's probably some like problematic stuff in there. There's probably some stereotypes in there. Um, but I, I, to me that the main problem was that this is the first book that person thinks of, or the only book this person thinks of when they hear that topic, right? After 30 years, this is like, this is the story. And I, and it's not to say anything about that particular person, but it's, I think it's, possibly more about the published industry, right? And who is getting published, who's getting the big advances, who's getting the big five publishers, who's reviewed in the New York Times, right? And that all of that helps translate into who, like which versions of these stories do we know 30 years later? Or do people remember 30 years later? And, and um, yeah, that's it's there's a lot there on that topic. Yeah, for sure. You know, it's kind of maybe like a little bit like the memoirs of a geisha example. <laughs> so yeah. That's the not that's the other one, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's the other one. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. It's uh hard yeah, when you can't control who gets represented, you know. Okay, so let's move on. And everybody definitely should read read the book it's it's really uh 
it's really interesting. I think um, again, we wrote it with like a lot of sensitivity, mm -hmm. and and also, you know, um, I like the way that you um, express your opinions throughout the book in terms of the situation, which is really complicated and and in some ways very unfortunate. But I think you did a great job. Okay, next question. Um, so um, the book in the book. Uh, Night in the American Village, um, you broke up the chapters uh, to feature one woman per chapter um, and all the women live on Okinawa. So can you talk about some of the cultural and historical relationship dynamics between women who live in Okinawa and the US military? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so for, for people who might not know, you know, during World War II, the US military invaded Okinawa. It was the only land battle fought in Japan during the Pacific War. And it was, you know, a horrible, horrible battle between the Japanese Imperial Army and the US military. And people in Okinawa were really just caught in the middle. They were, you know, living on this battlefield basically. Um so, you know, the initial relationship was, you know, is rooted in war and everything that 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 means so there at that time there was a lot of sexual violence um committed by u.s service members against women in okinawa um at that time u.s soldiers rarely faced consequences for these crimes um that sadly continued after the war because the u.s military occupied okinawa for 27 years and during that time okinawans weren't citizens of Japan or the United States, so they didn't have rights. Um, you know, there was a very unequal power dynamic between the occupiers and the occupied, right? Um, at that time, the U.S. military also sanctioned sex work, so a lot of women in Okinawa turned to sex work during the occupation to feed their families, and, you know, it was the, sometimes the only option they felt they had, right? Um in 1972, Okinawa became a part of Japan again, and it, the relationship became a little bit more equal because now Okinawans had the protection of being Japanese citizens and their economic power increased. So, um, you know, there's still definitely the issue of sexual violence that has continued. But I think, you know, these days you see a lot of marriages, dating relationships between um, women in Okinawa and U.S. service members. And since the occupation, the women in the uh, kind of red light districts around the bases have become more often women from the Philippines who migrate to Okinawa to do these do this type of work. Um, and I have a chapter about that in my book as well. So, you know, in all of this, I really wanted to highlight the women's agency and, you know, not show them as objectified victims, um, but, you know, show the actions that they have taken to, that they are, you know, protesting this violence, um, they're activists, they're also sometimes like choosing to have some type of relationship with the US military presence, because they can get something that they want. And um, it was surprising to me, talking to people that, you know, a lot of times it was that was about identity, and it, women were saying that they could, exercise a part of their identity in these American spaces in ways that they couldn't in Japanese or Okinawan society. And that was something surprising to me that I wanted to show, you know, overall, I just wanted to show the women's perspective, because I think in the U.S. especially, we've more often heard the soldier's perspective. Right, right. That's a good point. Okay. Um, so uh, I'm going to move on to the next question. So I'm going to read um, an excerpt from uh, Kemi's article that was published in The Guardian in 2019. And the title is, Asian women and the kimono have long been sexualized in Western culture. Um, and, uh, if you guys want to read some of these articles, um, a couple of them are linked to the, pay the appreciation versus appropriation page. So um, check it out. Um, okay, so here's the excerpt. Uh, the two Asian women painted on the facade of the Irish pub outside the U.S. military base in Okinawa, Japan, wore kimono. They lounged on a white sand beach. Their black hair was coiled atop their heads, 
and their garments were falling open to reveal bare legs and cleavage. Never mind that the real women in the area don't dress like that. Instead of kimono and updos, they sport colored contacts, blonde hair extensions, fake tans, and jeans. Never mind that kimonos are ankle length and high neck high necked covered up. To the artist or bar owner, the picture that would draw men inside the epitome of desire was the woman in the kimono and an erotic style of kimono that does not exist. So how has the history of the US military occupation in Japan influenced the way kimonos are perceived in the US? Yeah, so <laughs> I think that, that that history has done a lot, um, you know, the, the, but even, you know, even before World War II, there was the, the, the Madame Butterfly story that some of you might know, and that opera came out in the early 1900s. So that was a story of a U.S. naval officer who goes to Japan and takes a 15-year-old Japanese girl as his wife, as wife, you know, impregnates her, leaves, he gets married to a white woman, he comes back, and um, she kills herself, you know, um, so it's this tragic, sexualized story of an American soldier and an Asian woman um, that I think, you know, entered the American imagination, and then it gets kind of played out after um, World War II, the military occupation of Japan, but also Korean War, Vietnam War, right? It's just like kind of keeps getting um, recycled. Um, there's different versions of this story. And I think all of that in military action and Asia and this kind of story has led to stereotypes about Asian women as, you know, the geisha, the China doll, like the, um, you know, me loved you long time sex worker. Right. Um, we just see so many different variations of that. Um, and in all of that, the kimono right, can be seen as kind of a symbol for Japanese women or Asian women um, and like a kind of shorthand to use to represent all of that stereo those stereotypes. And so I wrote, you know, when I wrote that piece, I wrote that it wasn't surprising to me that Kim Kardashian would use the word kimono to try to sell underwear um, because like we've seen that kind of thing before. And I've, I've thought of the, um, this was, I guess this was already 10 years ago, but if anyone remembers, there was Katy Perry opened um, an award um, show dressed as like a geisha, but like a sexualized geisha with like this you know, kimono, again, kimono style that doesn't exist, that like shows a lot of cleavage, um, white face, and um, like all the stereotypes, and singing a song called about like unconditional love. So it was just totally playing back to that Madam Butterfly stereotype and story, you know, so we just we see this like all the time. So it's not surprising. But um, it's, it's definitely there in our in our American society, this idea of kimono as sexualized or, or symbolizing this um, stereotype about Asian women. Yeah, and I remember when I lived in the US, like the lingerie section is full of kimonos. They're meant to be like, <laughs> like bathrobes of seduction made of silk. <laughs> Still going on, right? Okay. Yeah, it's so far from what the kimono actually is in Japan. Right, right. Because, yeah, yeah, the kimono, yeah. normal kimonos don't work like that at all. <laughs> okay. So how have these um, sexualized perceptions of the kimono and by extension Japanese women impacted you or your Japanese heritage peers? Do you have any personal stories? Do I... I <laughs> Um, do I, I don't know if I have personal stories, luckily, I, I don't, I mean, I think, I think for, you know, I think it's not just Japanese American women, right? It's all Asian American women have to deal with this stereotype. And I think it's mostly comes out in dating, right? When you um, have to, like, if you date outside your race, you have to wonder, does this person really like me? Or do they like some idea of me, like some racial stereotype about me, right? Um, and 
I wrote about this a little while ago and I, I found women who would like, had like a catalog of like all the creepy things like men had said to them, like, like fetishizing them and, you know, um, objectifying them, you know, racializing them. So I think it's just something really with dating that women have to contend with often. Um, but I think it can, you know, also spill over to other areas, like that if you have this stereotype of Asian women as like submissive, quiet, weak, right? Um, subservient. And just, I think ultimately like not fully human, right? Is that's that's like what it's implying or that's that's like the, you know, the worst, the epitome of it. So um, I yeah, I think it's just something that every Asian American woman probably has felt in some way or had to deal with overtly in other ways yeah like uh trying to figure out the guy's dating history to see to figure out if he's like an Asian guy or not <laughs> it's like right right like are you just... ourselves in the U.S. Yeah. yeah 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 okay so that leads to the next uh question um do you consider the sexualization of the kimono and Asian women in general to be a form of racism? Yeah, I definitely do. I definitely do. I mean, it's, you know, it's assigning characteristics to someone just based on their race, right? That is racism and it's, you know, dehumanizing, harmful. So it's, to, it's, to me, it's definitely racism. And uh, how do you define cultural appropriation? I mean, we already touched on this a little bit, but can you give us your definition of what it is? Yeah, so I I am I do not have my own definition. So I'm leaving this to other people who have who have already, you know, defined it. But I, I think looking at what's out there, I really like the three P's that Emmy Ito talked about in her talk. So I, and I really recommend her talk if you haven't listened to it yet, but um, you know, with thanks to her, I'll go over those for people who might not know it, because I think that it, you know, this is a, can be a very complex, tricky topic. Like I said, I've just, I've been reading this long book about it just in literature and it's just, there's so much there. So I like this, these three P's because it's something easy to remember and you can kind of, um, it's easy to break it down and think about it that way. So um, her three P's are power, profit, and people. And power is refers to in cultural appropriation, there is a power dynamic with someone from a, a dominant group taking from a marginalized group. And that power dynamic is important because I think if you have people from the same group taking from each other it's something else if you have someone from a marginalized group taking from a dominant group it's something else and I think that is kind of it's more linked to the pressure to assimilate into that dominant group um so there's that power then there's profit which is about the way in cultural appropriation the member of the dominant group benefits from the appropriation. Um, so it doesn't have to be financial. It could be any type of um, profiting or any type of benefit. So you can ask yourself, if you're thinking about, is this a cultural appropriation? You can think, you know, who is benefiting from this? Who is being harmed by this? Um, and that will, you know, help tell you. Um, and I think, I think as Emmy, Emmy pointed out that it's important to note that a lot of times when um, someone from, you know, that person from the dominant group is taking this cultural item, they get rewarded for having that cultural item, whereas someone from the marginalized group might be mocked or ridiculed for having that same cultural item, right? So, and that's where the, the power comes in as well. And then the last one is people. So that's about how in cultural appropriation, people from the origin culture are erased. And um, it could be that they're like, they're literally not there, but I think it can also mean that they're there in a stereotypical way. So they're erased through stereotypes. Um, they're not getting credit. They're not getting, see they're not seen in an authentic way. Somehow they're erased. Um, and 
I just, that same book I just mentioned, Appropriate by Paisley Rectal, she had a point that I wanted to, to mention too, she, that I thought was important. She writes that questions about cultural appropriation, quote, cannot be asked and answered only once. They must be asked and, and answered every year, every decade. Power isn't static. Race and gender aren't static. So, you know, that to me, reminded me of what I was thinking about, about identity, right? How it's fluid and race and gender are fluid, power is fluid, right? So I think one of the main things also is just, is to be um, open-minded and fluid about cultural def cultural appropriation and, you know, be prepared to come back to these questions and be prepared to change your mind. Yeah, I definitely uh, really like any of those three pieces as well. So if you guys are interested, we have um, some of her articles linked on that page as well. And uh, you can also view her talk um, uh, that we did. It's uh, it's up on YouTube and it's linked to the page. But yeah, she gives really interesting perspectives about the um, power dynamic. And like in one case, um, she mentioned like um, uh, people maybe profiting uh, marginalized group people par uh, profiting from using like um, culture of a dominant group might be form of reparation as well. So she has like very nuanced views about it, which are really interesting. And um, uh, in, I never had thought about appropriation in ways that she has uh, really explored it. So it's definitely, I re that definitely recommend reading her article. Okay. Um, so please tell us uh, about uh, your upcoming book and um, it's about your family's incarceration at Tule Lake. So when did you learn that your grandfather was incarcerated there? And uh, yeah, tell us a little bit about what you've been researching. Yeah, so I'm I'm in the pretty early stages of researching this book. It's about my family history and the you know World War II incarceration of Japanese Americans. Um, my grandfather and his family were at Tule Lake concentration camp and when he was there he he and his younger brother renounced their U.S. citizenship along with more than 5,000 other Japanese Americans <clears throat> and um, I think you know since I was a kid I knew that my grandparents were incarcerated but I didn't know that much about it it wasn't something that we talked about in my family and, you know, certainly nobody knew about this renunciation, even my mom, that was something she learned after her dad died and found, you know, his documents. Um, so, you know, like a lot of Japanese Americans who, who were incarcerated, they, I think my grandparents felt shame, you know, about the experience. They didn't know how to talk about it, or they just felt like the best way to cope with it for them, or the only way was to just not talk about it right and repress it um but still the trauma has been passed down you know so I think something I'm trying to do with this project is you know finally tell their story try to figure out their story and try to you know and think about this the intergenerational trauma piece also um and also you know, again, like right against the stereotypes that I, that I, you know, even I believed, I always thought before that my grandparents were like, you know, I knew this like model minority story. Like they just, they never complain. They just work so hard afterwards. They, um, you know, just tried a hundred percent to be American. Um, when in fact, you know, I don't know, if my grandfather might have renounced his citizenship as a form of resistance. Right. And I think that's, I'm trying to look at this resistance narrative and think about how does that affect the later generations to, you know, reimagining this story that we thought we knew about our grandparents. Um, so it's again, like, you know, thinking through writing against the stereotypes. Okay, thank you. And um, you mentioned this in, uh, uh, in, a, in an article, I can't remember which one, but, um, picture of people like um, burning their kimonos in a bonfire, which I found like so disturbing. So why did Japanese heritage people at that time, you know, when the war began, why did they burn their kimonos and other Japanese belongings after Pearl Harbor? And uh, what happened to those people's properties and wealth and 
why did some people lose or renounce their U.S. citizenship? I know that's like a lot of questions rolled into one, but yeah, well, it's a it's a lot it's a lot of losing things, right? A lot was lost. Um, and I think yeah, that like for me too, that it's so visceral to and like blatantly symbolic, right? When you think about burning kimono or burning your stuff, right? It's like you're literally destroying your culture. Um, and it just kind of hits you in a way that other, you know, that's, that's so strong. Um, you know, so after, after Pearl Harbor, the, the FBI raided the homes of Japanese Americans, um, you know, looking for contraband. So they weren't allowed to have like radios and guns. Um, and if, you know, there was also, they were taking away the first generation Issei men if they were thought to be loyal to Japan in any way. Um, there were also just like people in the community raiding people's houses. So my my great aunt shared a story with me where when she was a kid after Pearl Harbor, her family was all at home asleep um, in their like farmhouse in Winters, California. And um, someone banged on the door and it was just two white men from nearby who stormed into their house, went through their stuff and took away their radio and, and like hunting rifles. And she said she she didn't share many emotions about the whole camp experience, but that, that one, she said it was really scary. It was just, like terrifying. Um, you know, so it's, it's like you're living at a time when like anybody can just come into your house and go through your stuff. And if they find something that like connects you to Japan, maybe they're going to take you away. Right. So I think it's understandable why people then felt like they had to get rid of all these things. So they burned, you know, sometimes anything um, that had to do with Japan at all. And another family story I have is that they had a sashimi knife that looked, they thought looked like a um, samurai sword. And so they like, they buried it in the orchard because they didn't want to have that item. Um, so that was one way people lost things. But then of course, like they also had to go to camp, right? The government forced them from their homes and into camps and they could only take what they could carry. So they lost everything, right? Um, that's another way they lost everything. And so our, you know, families like mine, we have lost these, um, what could have been family heirlooms or cultural items that could have passed down, right. Um, in the family. Um, and then in terms of the citizenship part, that was later on in the war in camp, the U S government passed a law that allowed American citizens to give up their citizenship during war and they passed it specifically for the Japanese Americans at Tule Lake and there were a variety of reasons people renounced ended up renouncing they some it was out of protest to what the U.S. government had done um, some wanted to stay with their family members who they thought were going to go back to Japan some um were pressured by pro-Japan groups who were in the camp, um, even with threats of violence sometimes. Um, some were like fed misinformation, rumors. Um, there were so many different reasons. And I think that's something I'm trying to really, I, I'm really trying to, I want to tell that story and figure out as much as I can what happened there. Right. I mean, that you know, I don't have a history, my family doesn't have a history of incarceration, but just hearing these things is like, it's, it must, that's so much trauma, you know. Um, okay. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so, um, how has the experience of your family members being detained at a concentration camp impact your relationship with your Japanese identity? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, for just, you know, from the last question, it is clear, right, that um, it was, you know, you were not supposed to be Japanese, right, it, to have Japanese culture to be Japanese was, um, was, you know, literally labeled wrong, right, by the US government. And so I think, 
it wasn't, it was an unspoken thing in my family, but I think I very much felt that, you know, it was better to try to assimilate into whiteness than to like hold on to these traditions or pass down the language, pass down the culture, right? Um, it, that was something I really felt in my family. Um, so, you know, I think, I think partly, you know, the one thing I did get was like my, my name, my Japanese name. And I think that really, in, has influenced me and why I've done the things I've done. I think in a way that was like, I received this I, Japanese identity that I, then I felt I had to look up to, you know, um, or I had to uh, live up to. Um, but in any case, I do feel like, you know, the incarceration did impact my Japanese identity, but it's something that I have worked to change in my lifetime and um, something I feel really strongly about, you know, changing for the next generation. Okay, so um, with your family's history in the U.S. being what it is, um, your the Japanese okay. side of your family, um, do you think that history impacts the way you feel when you see Japanese non-Japanese people? profiting from Japanese culture? Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I don't think it's, I don't think this is something I like see and, and think about a lot, but I, I, you know, I def, I think it definitely does, you know, um, affect me, you know, because, you know, when somebody had somebody who's hasn't gone through what my family has, has some Japanese cultural item, right. It's just, it, it's um it there's so much less meaning attached to that than than someone like me having it and having to you know my family lost it and then I had to fight to get it back and that this was something in the past like people would have been detained for or you know um ridiculed for or had so much like fear and shame around having you know so there's just like so much history there and I think what what bothers me the most probably is that people just don't understand or know that history. You know, there's still so many people who don't, don't learn about it, don't know about it, or just know a very small amount. So um, I think that's, you know, that's partly why I want to write this next book is I just think education is a big part of it for me. Yeah. I think that, you know, you provide such an important perspective in terms of like um, cultural appropriation and especially how, you know, Nikkei people who have lived in the West, you know, feel about it. And especially given your family history, it's particularly even more like um, upsetting, I think, you know, when you, uh, you know, when you see forms of cultural appropriation of Japanese culture, particularly for you. Um, so thank you. I think, I think, I just think like here, the other side though, is I think somebody like me could could also feel like I don't I don't own that item either right because I we've been made to feel that way right that, that like we don't have a connection to Japan or ownership of these cu cultural this culture this language anymore either right so I think it's like um that's a part of it too right that um we're still in the process of like trying trying to feel like we can claim these things even within our own like culture yeah. and group yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think, you know, thank you for sharing all that. You know, this is something that I don't know a lot about either. And I think many people don't. And, you know, when people say things like, well, why do you make such a big deal about it? It's like, you know, there are a multitude of perspectives of why it's a big deal to to some of us. And thank you for sharing your personal viewpoint about it. Um. Okay, so... We ask this uh, to all of our speakers. Um, so where do we go from here? You know, um, are there respectful ways that people can engage in cultural uh, in cultures that are not their own? And um, if you think if you think so, please give some examples. Yeah, I, I I mean, I definitely think there are ways. I don't think the answer is to not engage in any other cultures. You know, I think that's really important to engage in other cultures. I think um, carrying around these three Ps with you is really helpful and just keep those in mind, right? If you are engaging in another culture to ask yourself those questions, right? Like, 
am I from the dominant group? Like who is benefiting from this? Are the are other people benefiting as well? Am I erasing someone? Am I stereotyping someone, right? What can I learn? What do I not know that I could learn that would be helpful? Do I really know the history behind this, right? All of these questions we kind of touched on, I think are so important. So if people can ask those questions and be aware, they can definitely do it, you know? Um, I One example I thought of that I think, um, you know, is is respectful is that I have... There's a Buddhist church near me, a Japanese Buddhist church, and they have a lot of events like um, an Obon festival, like a cultural bazaar, and it attracts a lot of different people from the community, including non-Japanese people. And sometimes those people might dress up in yukata or kimono and, um, you know, dance, you know, bon dance or something, right? And to me, that is like totally fine and that's respectful. And like, if you want to wear traditional Japanese clothing, like that's where you can do it. Like that's like a safe space to do it. Like don't do it on Halloween. Don't do it like singing a song about unconditional love, right? Like there's ways that doing that same thing would be offensive, but if you find the right place, I think it's fine. And you're participating in someone else's culture like that. Um, and I think just, yeah, I think the bottom line is, you know, not to be afraid to interact with other cultures, engage with other cultures, but do it in a respectful, thoughtful way. Yeah. And I think um, also just to um, uh, point out again, what I mentioned earlier, like it might be helpful if sometimes you can ask a variety of people directly, like if they think what you're doing is offensive, because if you don't ask um, I think particularly within our Asian cultures, we, we're generally culturally non-confrontational. So we may not be able to say it unless we are asked directly as well. So um, yeah, if that's something that is possible for you, that I would recommend that too. And listen to the people, you know, uh, from the culture um, instead of outsiders talking about cultural appropriation. So uh, can we yeah. thank you so much for this? This is um, it really ties in a lot of things like in terms of history and race and you know like objectification of women due to the you know these uh, circumstances. So um, and racism and like um, how it ties to cultural appropriation. So thank you so much for sharing all this and your personal. Mm, thank you, thank you for having this whole series because I like you said I think it's something that people don't talk about sometimes or they're you know afraid or hesitant to talk about it um, because it can feel really touchy so I think it's so important that you're having these conversations and um, you know helping maybe people start thinking about it or have their own conversations so um, thank you for all the work that you do with and also with Made by Yuki yeah thank you yeah. okay so um, there's gonna be uh, actually there's gonna be like one more talk, um, which is gonna happen two weeks from now, and it uh, the speaker's name is Ray Masaki. He's a Japanese American designer living in Tokyo currently. He's written pretty interesting in, um, things about cultural appropriation in Japan as well. So it's super interesting. Um, so please make sure to sign up for that if if you can make it. Okay, thank you, Akemi. Thank you so much. I thank really you. Thank you, everyone who came to. It's nice to see some familiar names. And thank you so much, Yuki. <laughs> okay. Okay, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for the hour. I hope you have a great weekend. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>